Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Gloria, page 24. Glory be to God on high and on earth. Peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory, O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in thy well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. The readings begin on page three of your bulletin. Our first reading is a book from the prophet Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, starting at the first verse. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Our canticle is... Uh, a reading from the Canticle 16, the Song of Zechariah. It's on page 92 of your prayer book if you don't have your program with you. We'll do this by half verse. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies. He promised to show mercy to our fathers. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham. Free to worship without fear. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. For you go before the Lord prepared 
to give his people knowledge of salvation. In the tender compassion of our God, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Epistle to the Colossians, the first chapter, starting at the 11th verse. May you may be strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, the Lord. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? You are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to the Lord. Lord Christ. Thank you. You have a seat. Starting next Sunday, and for the whole month of December until Christmas, our theme and the theme of countless churches since late antiquity will concern the second coming of Christ. When the Bible reveals that he is to return from where he ascended, not to resume his previous role as a meek though miraculous rabbi, but to be king. Not merely king of his own very middling nation, Israel, but king over every nation and every people. Indeed, to be king of the universe. We call this season Advent. And what we will hear in that season from lessons drawn from both Testaments is that his kingship 
That is to say, the character of his government will be awesome, limitless, and for lack of a better word, totalitarian. Now, that's a scary word, I know, and I think some of you will find much to discuss in my using it. But nonetheless, objectively speaking and narrowly understood, it might also be the best, most accurate adjective. For consider what Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that in the kingdom which Jesus is to establish, all things are subjected to him. All things. Not just the executive branch, then, of a country or the legislature, not just a single arm of some military or a single department of the civil service, but all branches and all departments and all parliaments and all armies everywhere. We might recoil from the thought of one person having something like total control, because the events of the 20th century have taught us to do so. But as much as we know and are right to prefer democracy as the worst form of government except all the others that have been tried, to quote the superb Winston Churchill, there will be no need for politicians or presidents or even elections because Jesus, a morally immaculate man, will exercise, we are told, with excitement and relief in multiple places in the scriptures a supernatural, unapologetically unilateral and irreproachable dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth, as the psalmist puts it. And in this place, his subjects will be the saints, those redeemed by their faith in his sacrificial death. In other words, the perfect king will rule over the perfect place, inhabited by perfect men and women. Men and women who will gladly relinquish themselves completely to the sovereignty of their deserving Savior. So that's what the situation will be like in the new heavens and the new earth of paradise. But what about now? Well, there has emerged a persistent trend of Christian thought that claims everything is already being dictated from above. And there's some comfort, I suppose, in imagining that everything is already decided, whether a coin toss will be heads or tails, whether bacon or sausage for breakfast, how many children I should have, or which of two candidates will win in, say, I don't know, a senatorial race in Georgia. But I don't see that taught anywhere. I don't, in here. When I open its pages, I discover a God who has the capability to manipulate even every atom, sure, but prefers not to. A micromanager God would be a childish God who prefers playing with dolls to relationship with real people. And we've all been there. Many of us had Barbies or G.I. Joes. I, myself, loved my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures when I was eight. But they never brought me anything like the joy or the heartache of my friendships or my marriage. And anyway, look around, pick up a newspaper, turn on the TV, yes, God has had occasion in the past to harden a heart or two. His great plan of salvation has meant many interventions. But is he responsible for everything, or indeed for most of what we see going on? No. Jesus' half-brother James tells us in his epistle that no one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God, he says, cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. Rather, things are the way that they are because we are, to use a Latin word, in an interregnum. And what does that mean? Someone with an expensive private education, translate for us from the Latin. Interregnum, interrex, between kings. We are in an awkward, 
uncomfortable, uncertain transition. But what there is, is a prince. Isaiah tells us so. He tells us that the Messiah, who we know, thanks to the resurrection, is Jesus, eternal son of the Father. He says that Jesus is the prince of peace. And Daniel, who dreamt of the four great beasts in ancient Babylon, he calls the Messiah, who defeats those beasts, the prince of princes. We should, I think, pay close attention to that wording. Because a prince is, by definition, not a king. By definition, not a king, and in practice, not a king. Which is to say that Jesus hasn't yet taken up the mantle as rightful monarch of his creation. To take up the mantle, of course, is a reference to that old story of Elisha and Elijah. Elijah was a prophet in the classic sense of that term, in that he was an outsider who boldly spoke truth to power. And by that I mean he spent decades critiquing the awful, just awful, earthly kings of the Jewish people in the Promised Land in the early Iron Age, about 900 BC. And then famously, at the end of his ministry doing that, he was whisked away into the sky in a fiery chariot. And as he went up, his cloak, his mantle, came off. It fluttered down to the ground, where his protege, his padawan, Elisha, picked it up, put it on, and then continued his master's mission. We know then that Jesus hasn't put on the mantle of ruling in God the Father's place in a number of ways. There is, for instance, that moment with Stephen the deacon, the first Christian to be killed for his faith, who in the book of Acts is stoned to death by a mob of religious zealots stirred up by the priests of the temple. And as he dies in that horrific manner, between the blows of the rocks against his head, he cries out that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That's an important detail. Remember it. Because when we jump forward in time to the end of time, to what John uh, shows us in Revelation, the last book in the Bible, John sees something else, that something has changed. He sees Jesus, now represented symbolically as a lamb, no longer at the side of God, but standing, he says, at the center of the throne. It's a subtle but significant shift, which hasn't yet happened. And so, as I was saying, we seem to be in an interregnum. This is why we find that when he was with us in human form in the first century AD in Galilee and Samaria and Judea, Jesus didn't subvert kingship. He actively eschewed it. This is why he rode a donkey to his glorious, grisly fate on Golgotha in Jerusalem. It's why he deliberately uh, forwent the typical transport favored by proper royalty in that period. What was, the, what was that? It was either a war horse or a chariot or a palanquin. That's a sort of chair with a canopy carried by slaves on poles. And though in a way his 12 disciples form a sort of retinue of courtiers and entourage like kings had, they didn't serve to keep the riffraff, the peasants, away from their master. Indeed, Jesus rebukes them when they did that in their enthusiasm. He said, let them come to me. More than that, he said in a parable, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Exhibit A, of course, is the scene confronted, uh, uh, that Luke confronts us with today, the crucifixion. Verse 37, the Roman legionary said to Jesus, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Well, to be clear, of course, Jesus could have done that, just like he calmed the storm or raised Lazarus and did a thousand other amazing things. But apart from the fact that he had to die to secure for us the forgiveness of sins by taking the punishment we deserve. What we also witness incidentally on the cross is a demonstration of how Jesus is choosing to refrain from flexing the kind of almighty muscle, the power, the control, which is reserved for when he is the king of kings in the kingdom which, yes, has 
draw near, but it hasn't so far arrived. So evidently, things down here aren't as in heaven as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Because none of the persons of the Trinity are ruling right now by imposing their unopposable will. Consequently, as the prophet Micah observes, those who plot evil can carry it out because it is in their power to do so. Furthermore, what we find is that currently another figure is ruling, an imposter, a usurper, a conman, the devil. In John 12, 31 and 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan is called in the Greek the archon of this transitory moment of rust, moth, and thieves that we call human history. Archon means chief or supervisor. As such, he is prowling around causing havoc. Not that he can do so without our help, of course. He is a spirit, after all. We are his hands and feet. Without our cooperation, he is nothing. He can do nothing. So why do we help him? Because ultimately, I think, ultimately, we, we want to be king. We want to be in charge. As I reflect on the midterms, I think that perhaps we get so excited by politics, we get so enthusiastic that our man should win, and so despondent when he or she doesn't, because the modern state is so temptingly powerful. And being faithlessly anxious about the status quo, we want to have the reins. Or at least, we want someone like us to have the reins. Then we could force people to do what we want. Then we could force the world to look like we want it to look. But Jesus explicitly renounced this sort of tyranny for himself in the upper room before his arrest in Gethsemane, and then again does so implicitly in his interrogation before Pilate, despite knowing that that arrest would mean being murdered. So to be clear, the one who made us would rather be murdered than override our freedom to choose, even if that means our not choosing him and even revolting against him and making a dreadful mess of things. This brings me to my final point. Given that my choices aren't being constrained, they are truly mine and I'm responsible for them, and Jesus has charged me to live, we hear this morning in Luke 1, as if he were already reigning, which is to say to be holy and righteous in his sight. When I don't do that, when I gossip, when I'm greedy, when I lie, my actions falsify my hope of what I claim is coming. It suggests that I haven't really submitted myself to the prince who I say one day will be the king. But like the impenitent thief crucified with Jesus, rather I've allied myself instead with the powers of this dark world as in Ephesians 6. Just let that sink in. The impenitent thief, short-sightedly, chose those who were killing him over Christ, the giver of abundant life. Because the power that they had in that fleeting instance, expressed in the violence directed at his own person, was so seductive. How perverse, perhaps, Yet without the gift of the Holy Spirit, might we be vulnerable to making a similar mistake? So inspired by the promises of the prophets, let us be like the thief who was hung on the other side of Jesus. He didn't put his faith in Jesus because of present circumstances, but for what he trusted will be true in the future. Amen. Would you please stand for the Nicene Creed found on page 327. Let's pray together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And, and he, he shall, shall come, come again, again with glory to judge, to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall, shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, Ghost the Lord, Lord and, giver and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. The prayers continue on page 328. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications, and to give thanks for all men. Receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially the Archbishop of Canterbury and the primates of the Anglican Communion, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, for Andy, Ben, and Nigel, our clergy, that they may by their lives and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority in this and every land, especially Joe, our president, Glenn, our governor, Robert, our mayor, Jason, Virginia Attorney General, and Ann Farrell, our delegate, that they, along with our military, be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O oh Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. I ask your prayers for the new babies, and we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, mentally ill, or any other adversity, either aloud or silently, please add your own petitions. And we also pray thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty God, 
Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Would you please stand? My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. Thank you again for joining us here at Galilee Episcopal Church on the oceanfront in Virginia Beach. We were glad to have you, and we pray you have a wonderful week. If you enjoyed this morning, please like us on Facebook and Instagram. For more content, subscribe to us on YouTube. And when you do, click that bell so you get notifications about future content. God bless you and keep you.